All right, welcome to the Asia leg of our webinar series on alternative assets in 2020. My name is JS and I am the head of product for the APAC region at Prequin. And with me today is Ifai, head of research APAC. So once again, thank you all for joining us today from across the region. Um, let's have a look at the poll results. And I see that most of you are joining us from home. So we're all doing our part to flatten the curve. Um, so we hope everyone is keeping safe, um, staying well in this COVID-19 situation. And thank you again for uh, making time to join us. So before we start off, just some housekeeping rules. You've been set on mute, so please do feel free to um, use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to drop questions at any time during the session. Uh, and we will address it at the end of the presentation. We will also have a very short survey at the end of today's session where five lucky respondents will walk away with a complimentary copy of the Prequin 2020 Global Alternatives Reports. Thanks, JS. And hello, everyone. This is Ifai. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, wherever you're dialing from. I know that we have a few friends who have joined us all the way from the US. We're glad that you could join us. Each year, my colleagues the world over we do a gauging of sentiments of the alternatives industry, asking them the why, what, and the how of investing in the next 12 months. We then combine that with analysis and insights from our database to produce reports that serve as roadmaps for practitioners globally. In today's session, JS and I will highlight some of the most important insights in these reports to guide us as we navigate the landscape in 2020. Yes, that's right, Ifai. We will bring you through the key industry trends, look at what are important challenges that investors might face, and the outlook for 2020, especially in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. So for starters, uh, just a quick update on Prequin. Just as how the alternative industry has grown, so has Prequin. And we were just a team of over 100 about 10 years ago. And now we are about 500 staff worldwide and growing. I'm very pleased to let you know that we actually opened two offices last year in Chicago and Tokyo. And just last month, we also opened our operations in Sydney, Australia. So this is all part of our strategy to provide the best data intelligence by having boots on the ground and local expertise to serve our global customer base. All right, Ifai, shall we start with the current state of play as we enter 2020? Sure, Jess. I'm really keen to show our listeners a key metric on the health of the industry, and that is AUM. In 2018, we published a report called The Future of Alternatives, where we forecasted that AUM was going to experience an 8% CAGR growth from 2017. And guess what? We were right on the money. Based on that formula, AUM was to reach $10.3 trillion in 2019, and our data shows that it has. Furthermore, we have observed a three times increase in AUM from the global financial crisis after investors wised up to the fact that diversifying from traditional investments and adding return drivers to portfolios were key to being good stewards of money. The main driver of this threefold increase was private capital, especially in private equity and venture cap, private debt, and real estate. If we look at the shape of this graph, we can see that the growth has accelerated in the last couple of years. This, as we will hear later, is a result of two things, record amount of capital raised, and enthusiasm in asset valuation. On the hedge fund side of things, AUM has also grown, but at a much more modest pace, from slightly over $3 trillion in 2014, it is now 3.6 trillion. In addition, g investors rocked by US-China trade tensions and Brexit withdrew a total of $97 billion over the course of 2019. 
this amount is slightly over 2% of the AUM. Hedge fund managers have had to combat market perception that they are too expensive, too complex, and underperform, especially in the last few years when public equities rose and rose. Investors then ask themselves whether they will be better off just investing in low cost ETFs. Because hedge fund returns are pegged to market and released every month or every quarter, their returns are often lumpy and volatile. And news of systemically important investors closing or reducing their hedge fund allocation are familiar to us all. Increasingly sophisticated investors are also setting up their own in-house public market team. We should expect tough conditions for hedge funds to persist. Those that would do well are funds which can demonstrate value to investors by providing access to strategies they, could otherwise, they couldn't otherwise get into. Providing a hedging quality to investors and outperform the wider market by a significant margin and doing so consistently. Now, JS, I know that fundraising is a key data point for our clients and the product team has done a lot of work around surfacing that data and aggregating that into time series graphs for our charts. What is our fundraising data telling us? Yes, Ifai, we've, we've done quite a bit of work surfacing these fundraising insights on Prequin, on Prequin Pro, and we found that a key contributor to the rising AUM is this record fundraising. So as highlighted in this red box on the chart you're seeing here, although growth has slowed over the last two years, managers have still managed to raise over $1 trillion every year since 2017. And one of the key reasons for continued investor appetite is private capital has been able to produce returns. And by returns, I think LPs are not looking purely based on IRR alone. But in fact, many more are telling us that other metrics matter as well. For example, DPI is something they look out for. The statistics are telling. And if we take vintage 2014 funds as an example, First quarter PE funds that are generally halfway through their lifespan has had almost all capital drawn down by now with distributions in the range of 50 to over 300%. So this has also prompted a lot of GPs to raise follow-on funds to mirror success of their earlier vehicles. And that brings me to my next point on capital consolidation. So here, in, the, in, the, in this chart, you can see that the blue line indicates fund count, whereas the gray line indicates total capital raised. So it is clear here that the number of funds that have successfully closed have not really kept pace with the total capital raised. And this capital consolidation means fewer managers are holding on to more of the world's available capital. So this is driven by two things. Number one, challenging economic conditions, and number two, the flight to quality phenomenon. As mentioned earlier, the world has had to deal with trade friction between superpowers, as well as uncertainty over Brexit and things like that. And these have had a knock-on effect for capital-seeking hopes. The likes of Blackstone, EQT, and Hill House, big global brand names with years of track record, are able to attract investors with proven stability and that deal-making prowess. And closer to home in Asia, we are also seeing that happening in our VC world. And players like East Ventures, Vertex, Vickers have all been able to build on their track record and raise capital that exceeded the industry average. So something interesting to also note is on this chart here, this very trend that we're seeing now is in fact mirroring those observed over a decade ago. The capital consolidation has led to mega funds. And these monster-sized mega funds are defined as those with more than 2.5 billion in um, commitments and is represented by these blue bar here. So they now occupy 
about 50% of the market in 2019. And you will see on this chart how the proportion of capital raised by fund size has evolved over the last 10 years. These mega funds tend to be global in nature. They include having local teams in major markets that maximize access to quality deals. And conversely, we'll see that funds in that 100 to 499 million bracket have decreased. Taken together, 2019 was a tough year for first-time managers, with first-time funds accounting for just a little bit more than 800 funds in 2018 to only about 570 of all funds closed last year. All right, so switching gears, the question at the top of everyone's minds would be, what is the impact of COVID-19 on the alternatives industry? And before Ifi walks us through the what the data says, um, let's run a poll to get a sense of what you, what the audience think. So the question here is, which activities are more likely to see an immediate impact from COVID-19? Is it number one, deal flow? Number two, fundraising? Number three, LP allocations? Or in fact, no immediate impact? All right, please take a moment and let us know your responses. All right. Let's have a look at the responses. All right, I think let's wait a little bit more for more responses to come through. Um, interesting, so we can see that the audience generally thinks that fundraising followed by deal flow will see the most immediate impact. So if I, um, just a question for you, is this something the pre queen research team is seeing as well from the data that we have? Yes, uh, so just looking at uh, these poll results, it reflects exactly what we're seeing on our data. COVID-19 has primarily impacted fundraising and deal making. And Q1 has been the worst performing quarter in years. I'll be sharing more details as we go along, but you may also check out the series of research notes that we have put out on the impact of COVID-19 on the industry. And we will continue to put out as the situation ev evolves. Links are in the chat box um, on your right. So the APAC fundraising picture is very different to the global one in two ways. Number one, there, were the, there was the US-China trade war. And number two, COVID-19 had a much earlier impact in APEC. The US-China trade tension started in 2018. And we need to bear in mind that Chinese funds account for more than half of APEC funds. So when they had a bad year, the APEC total went down as well. And COVID-19 hit Asia first. China went into lockdown for two months now, while the rest of Asia had been out of action for about a month. Roadshows have been put on hold while due diligence cannot be completed. At about $9 billion raised so far, this is the worst quarter for APEC since at least 2013. Those who managed to successfully close, though, were rewarded with more capital than originally targeted. And we think that this could be because these managers had already reached their targets or were about 90% there, right, at the end of 2019, but just wanted to leave things open to wrap up the last few conversations with LPs. We'd expect fundraising for the rest of this year to be challenging, though Q2 should still be supported by some funds wrapping up talks with LPs. In this climate, the market should move away from first-time funds looking to start new relationships with LPs and instead move to GPs seeking re-ups with LPs they already know and have successfully worked with. One bright spot in APEC has been private credit. It started gaining traction in US and Western Europe after the GFC, owing to new regulations on banks. Overall, it's still a nascent asset class here, but in locations like Greater China, Japan, and Australia, we have seen a rise in fundraising activity. 
especially in Australia, where there's a gap left by the big four domestic banks. Private credit funds have jumped in to support buyout and control transactions. With COVID-19, there's been a first wave of companies severely impact, uh, impacted. And these are all widely documented in the press, the hotels, airlines, F&B, retail. And as the crisis peaks, the next waves will be the banks, the manufacturers, business services, basically anything and anyone that cannot continue with economic activities because of lockdowns and reduced consumption. And this will then produce opportunities for distressed debt, senior loans and other strategies high up on the debt ladder. 2019 was not kind to hedge funds. For the first time in the last few years, the number of liquidations, the bars in blue, exceeded the number of fund launches, those that are in dark gray. And we can see here on this slide, the evolution of this pressure that was building since 2013. It finally boiled over last year. And this was made all the more worse because simply buying the S&P 500 in January would have netted investors a 30% gain by December. With market volatility again acting up in 2020, though this time for a different reason, hedge fund managers have their work cut out to convince investors to continue to entrust their money to them. We saw earlier how fundraising has peaked at $1 trillion a year. This chart shows us how much of that capital is yet to be deployed. You will notice a similar trajectory to fundraising and that same acceleration upwards in the last few years. GPs are incentivized to deploy capital. So why has dry powder accumulated? Well, GPs have definitely been actively investing, but part of the reason for this accumulation is valuation. In our survey last year, asset valuation was highlighted for the third year running to be the top concern of both GPs and LPs. This was what was keeping GPs up at night wondering if it was the peak of the cycle and whether they might overpay for a deal. Obviously, this was before COVID-19, so things may look different this year. Yes, Ifai, and, and this concern was also on display in, in terms of deal volume, which we saw a drop across the industry. So just like fundraising, APEC deals experienced a similar drop in activity in the quarter to date. And the data on Prequin Pro shows that quarter one of 2020 is the lowest recorded quarter by deal activity in recent years. So of course, I don't think this comes as a surprise. Um, since COVID-19 started, valuations have dropped significantly. And uh, with the global economy entering a recession, we can expect very attractive buying opportunities to present themselves, which is great for managers with the dry powder. There are also early signs that some deals which were thought to have closed late last year are being reopened and renegotiated. But generally, we see that managers may be more cautious about deploying capital in the near future. The city lockdowns and, and travel advisories prevent managers from completing due diligence, specifically in the crucial stages where they have to visit physical operations or meet the management teams of target company assets. Um, and managers with teams on the ground will certainly have an advantage. Those that do not may have to adapt to the new normal and update their internal assessment criteria, rely on technology to bring deals over the line. So we've actually also heard of some real estate managers employing drone footages and 360 camera views to inspect uh, property. And, and this might very well be increasingly the new normal. So our, our intel also suggests that in locations where a sense of normalcy has slowly returned, um, for example, in the last couple of weeks in China, new deals can still be made and perhaps as early as the second half of 2020. 
And for everywhere else, we can expect finalization of deals for, for those deals that um, started negotiations in 2019, and, and those will still have a reasonable chance of completion. Well, if I have talked quite a bit about the impact of COVID-19 on fundraising and on deal flow, um, how does the research team at Prequeen help the industry understand about changes to investor appetite and expectations? Yes, JS, to understand investor appetite, um, the research team reach, reach out to LPs globally and you know, we ask them questions about what they plan to do in the next 12 months. We ask them uh, questions about their reallocations and all of that information, you know, that then flows straight into the database. In order to understand investor appetite, there are two things to consider, the how and the why. And first up, the how. We track more, more than 12,000 institutions worldwide from sovereign wealth to family offices and everything in between. And these are guys who are active in alternatives. More than 70% invest in at least one asset class with the likelihood of that being private equity, the highest. Real estate, which is one of the world's oldest asset class and one of the most well understood, comes in a close second at 60%. Now this spider web chart provides a window into the why of investing. Each asset class is attractive for a set of unique reasons. For example, we just focus on P, the dark gray lines. It's seen to provide high absolute returns, while private credit and real estate are priced for their reliable income streams. But the overwhelming motivation for investing in alternatives is actually diversification. Alternatives provide diversification from traditional assets, and there's also strategy and geography diversification benefits. And the world learned a very important lesson in supply chain diversification when US-China trade tariffs started. And now with COVID-19, splitting of workforce and BCP plans as a form of diversification have again come to the fore. One of the parameters driving investor decision-making is analysis of historical fund performance. While market benchmarks inform the strategizing and due diligence process, we all know it only tells one part of the story. So, Here's a poll to ask our audience, in your view, what is the biggest limitation in fund performance benchmarks? Is it a lack of timely information or a lack of adequate comparable sample size? Or do you find that there's a lack of quality and in-depth historical information in these benchmarks? Or if it's none of the, none of, none of the three, than others. Thanks, Ifa. I think this is a really interesting question and we all know that there are a lot of methodologies and uh, benchmarks um, in the industry. Um, and while none of them can claim to be perfect, um, I think we all agree that they are useful when appropriately applied. Um, so let's have a look at how the audience has responded on this topic regarding limitations on benchmarks we have today. All right, so pretty close one. I can see the one leading there is the lack of adequate comparable sample size and certainly something we hear quite a bit, especially as we have growing niches and specializations. Um, you know, the, the, the big question is what is comparable? Um, and it's, it's something that we are actually looking to solve as well. Our data science team at Prequin is, is looking at some creative ways to address that. Um, but interesting to know, and then in second place, we have um, uh, lack of quality and in-depth historical information followed by timely information. Well, thank you very much for your insight. I think that that's really, really helpful. Um, 
and again, while, while, while there is no perfect benchmark, I think um, you know, we can all agree that, that there, is, there is value that, that each of them bring. Yes, JS, and in a similar vein, uh, we often debate about the limitations of IRR as a measure of performance, right. but it remains as the most appropriate and commonly used metric in general. And so that will help us, you know, as we look at the next slide on returns. On the left, we can see returns are largely within expectations with private equity being the highest and natural resources being the lowest because of sustained low energy prices in recent years. And, you know, as we can see from recent news, this low energy prices is going to persist for a while longer. It's early days, but 2016 vintage funds seem to be producing lower IRRs because they are mostly deploying during the boom years, thus buying up assets at peak valuation. Last year and this year should see a tapering in asset value. And so 2016 funds, which have not fully deployed, should see pretty good buying opportunities surface. And vintage 2020 will be very interesting if past crisis is an indicator of things to come. We found that the returns of private equity funds raised right before the GSC was lower by three percentage points versus those that were raised right after the GFC. And the bubble chart on the right is a very classic example of the saying, higher risk, higher return. LPs should find this chart helpful in crafting their portfolio for the same level of risk. Real estate seems to be a better driver of returns than infrastructure. Now investors tell us that their returns have mostly met or exceeded their expectations. Uh, last year when we were doing the survey, the obvious exceptions are hedge funds and natural resources in the red boxes for discussions we discussed, for reasons that we discussed earlier. And on the topic of returns, I know that JS, you've been leading a project to help bring greater transparency to the market through partnerships with industry associations. Yes, if I, um, as a team, we're very committed to working with the industry to shed light on markets as potential investment destinations for LPs globally. And we've seen that transparency and the ease of navigating markets have always been strong pool factors for LPs. Um, and we hear often from industry players across our APEC region um, that they want to create these favorable conditions as well. Um, so, for example, we have joined projects with industry associations like the Korea PEF Association, uh, the Japan VC Association, just to name a few. Um, and all of these programs uh, aim to drive consistency in reporting practices and to jointly release these market-specific granular benchmarks. Um, so, in these programs, Prequeen just acts... Uh, as the collector of the data, we validate the data. We also analyze the data and publish these findings at an aggregated level so that everyone in the industry, um, within the industry and, and externally looking into the industry uh, benefit from that step increase in transparency for specific markets uh, that are more, maybe more opaque today. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to find out how the audience feels about such initiatives. So let's run a poll just to see the level of interest in participating in such initiatives that drive greater transparency. And let's think about it from the perspective of your segment. Um, so yes, no, or, or whether it depends on, on the terms of participation. All right, uh, let's have a look at the results and see what everyone thinks about their role in driving transparency as an industry. Wow, this is an overwhelming yes, and it depends. Um, and I, I think this is, this is great, great for our region. It's definitely food for thought for all of us. 
uh, in terms of what we want as an industry and how we can move forward meaningfully together. Um, and definitely there's a lot to, that we can learn from you know, some of the more developed mature markets in, in, in this space. So thank you for your insight. Um, Ifai, is there anything more on areas of focus for investors? Yes, uh, JS, outside of returns, uh, there's one area which is gaining um, a lot of importance and prominence, and that's ESG. At the moment, the proportion of investors with an ESG policy in place all are planning to roll one out this year, makes up less than 50%. While that may not seem like much, if we look back 10 years ago, ESG was really only on the radar of big pension funds or organizations which could afford to sacrifice returns for ESG. And sacrifice, you know, I'm saying it with an air quote. The conversation has intensified and matured since the number of UNPRI signatories have increased by five times. And I've just heard that, you know, some family offices are also coming on board as UNPRI signatories. The industry is starting to understand that ESG compliance and returns may not necessarily be competing objectives and policies nowadays go deeper and beyond just not investing in bad sectors. And we too are excited about ESG and we understand the importance of this data to our clients. And so we have just launched a new feature that allows users to track a fund manager and an investor's policy in terms of whether they are looking at ESG, SRI or impact investing, when was such policies established, as well as provide the direct links to these ESG or policy documents. And all of these are just the first phase of our ESG coverage. My colleagues on the product team are actively developing a methodology for rating managers on ESG compliance based on the what, the who, and where they invest in. So more to come on this front. So at the start of this webinar, you know, I mentioned that we are right on the money on our AUM forecast for 2019. And this is where we think the industry will be by 2023, $14 trillion. And this is for us a conservative estimate that's based on CAGR growth of 8% between now and then. No doubt COVID-19 has and will continue to bring a lot of pain, but this storm will not last forever. And we mustn't forget that it does bring opportunities as well. The industry is known for a never say die attitude and being bold in maximizing opportunities during this time of the crisis and preparing for recovery is a hallmark of this industry. Having said that, there is an unprecedented number of funds seeking capital. As of last month, we have had, we have more than 1,600 funds in the market looking for a home. And we should not expect every single one of these 1,600 funds to be able to close successfully because that is a fact of life, virus or not. Our data already shows that APEC funds have had the slower start to Q1. And I mentioned earlier that about $9 billion have been raised so far, and this is about 20% over the same period in 2017. So in order to be successful, managers will have to engage LPs using technology using video conferencing and sharing documents securely through virtual data rooms. Managers need to start looking after their existing portfolio because now is the best time for initiatives like asset enhancements and to bring about the digital transformation which was previously only talked about. And thirdly, show the capacity to continue doing deals 
in this climate. Yes, Ifai, and in the pursuit of real returns, we can see that investors do intend to increase exposure to alternatives. As you can see on this slide, uh, this is especially so for private equity and private debt, where over 40% of investors surveyed express intention to do so. And, and one of the most frequent questions we've been asked since early February was whether investors are spooked by the virus. Um, I think while we don't have a crystal ball in front of us, um, the overwhelming response we hear from investors is a resounding no. And, and that was also the same response we heard when the news of US-China tariffs broke. And, and that's simply because investors tell us that they are viewing these relationships in long 10, 20, 30 years horizons. Back in November, investors also told us that they expected strong performance to continue this year. This view, of course, was expressed prior to the coronavirus outbreak. Um, and with the current situation, we must reasonably expect that exits will be challenging. And we talked about it earlier. Due diligence on the part of acquirers will also be difficult. And funds coming to the end of their lifespan may be granted a year or two extension to dispose of assets under more favorable conditions. So, so this is an interesting one. We worked with our partners at FRG and we put together a forecasting model to see how managers might adjust their capital calls and distributions in light of the coronavirus situation. So in order to model the impact, uh, FRG created a pandemic scenario, which we compared to baseline figures. So, Look closely at this chart with the light, uh, there is a light blue line representing real GDP. And there you will see that the pandemic scenario assumes that we undergo a significant but brief recession in Q2 2020, so at the early part of the chart, and then a sharp rebound from Q3 2020 onwards. All right, so that's the assumption for the pandemic scenario. And we focus our analysis on 2017 to 2019 vintage funds uh, because they represent over 70% of callable dry powder there is in industry. So there's quite a bit going on here. So let me explain the chart. Um, the bar chart represents capital calls as a negative value. So the blue and the gray bars are capital calls and each representing the respective scenarios. And then the distributions are positive values, the orange and yellow bars. And then consequently, we have the green and gray lines that indicate the net cash flow for both scenarios. So our model suggests that GPs will respond in two key stages. Stage one, there would be a sharp reduction in capital calls and distributions in the first half of 2020, as we expect deal activity to be muted and managers delay exits to avoid selling in a downturn, um, and then generating positive cash flow, net cash flow in the second half of 2020. In the second stage, we'll see an acceleration of capital calls and distributions through the later half of 2021, as asset prices and deal volumes rebound. So in summary, the crisis will shift out the J curve and reduce capital calls and distributions today and amplifying them in the future. While a recession does pose material risk to portfolio companies and exits today, it also represents a record opportunity for fund managers to buy at low prices after the longest bull market in history. And this does, in fact, bring meaningful opportunity for recent vintage funds. Thanks, Jess. Uh, so we've, we're coming to the, to, to the end of our webinar, and I just want to summarize what are some of the key takeaways from today's session. The industry was in peak health at the end of last year. Uh, we are at $10.3 trillion in terms of AUM. And fundraising growth you know, continued to be low. And the biggest headline now has got to be COVID-19. 
we should expect further contraction this year, but we have faith in the industry's resilience and adaptation to the new normal. And the long-term success of alternatives is very much still intact. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. Um, once again, thank you very much for joining us today. We'll now move to the Q&A segment. Um, and so let's just have a quick look at what are the, some of the questions that have come through, if there are any. So there's one question here. Uh, what advice can you give to first time funds looking to establish relationships with LPs in light of current uncertainties and trend towards consolidation? Uh, I think managers would know very well how tough a time it is at the moment and um, trying to speak to LPs with all roadshows, physical, in-person roadshows cancelled and all flights cancelled. Um, I think we, we, we should look at you know, what, fun, what managers have successfully done before and that is a consistently good track record will always be very helpful in convincing new LPs to come on board. Um, demonstrating the ability to continue to function during this period of crisis, having a good BCP uh, in place would also be very helpful. The journey will be very, very tough, but it's not entirely impossible. So uh, just to you know, touch on the points which I, which I mentioned uh, earlier in this webinar, having the abilities to still engage LPs via video conferencing and to be, still be able to share documents uh, securely via virtual data rooms, having the ability for um, LPs to sign these documents and to submit these through online means will be very helpful as well. Uh, we, from, from what we've been hearing from LPs, they are still keen to deploy capital and uh, for them, the, they are still very much in the market to continue to do due diligence. So the due diligence process for them, it's, it's not a one step process, it's multi, multiple steps, right? And one very prominent Korean um, pension fund said that they can still uh, conduct 90% of their due diligence up to the step where they need to physically uh, in person have, have, have in person meetings. And that's the step which cannot be done at the moment, but all of, all of those stages that can be done before that step can still be completed and still be arranged during uh, this crisis. So in summary, uh, if I, you know, if I'm in a position to give advice to first-time funds, be very prominent and very intentional about sharing your track record about the, the personal work history of your team. Make sure that you have a very good and coherent BCP plan in place, preferably one that continues to allow you to be in touch with LPs. Uh, and I hope I've, you know, I hope that 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 gives uh, some clarity to, you know, what we think would be, at, what we think first-time funds should do. Let's have another. Let's have a look at another question. With regard to ESG, there was a comment made that ESG was and has been initially adopted by investors able to sacrifice in air quotes returns. Can I please ask if this is a preprint view that ESG incorporation results in the sacrifice of returns? And if this view is one that is shared by the alternatives industry? Well, uh, for sure, this view is shared by some in the industry, continues to be persistent in certain jurisdictions. And you know, I would say that in certain emerging markets where 
their, uh, where their focus is still very much on returns, this is something that is hindering their ability to move into the ESG space. For Prequin, obviously, you know, we look at the industry as a whole and by us developing a feature on our database um, that looks very much at ESG and by us investing you know, in producing a methodology to rate managers on ESG, um, I think really shows that we don't think that returns and ESG compliance are two competing objectives. Right, I, I hope that answers your, your question. Let, let's, uh, let's see if we have time for one more. Yeah, I'm seeing some, uh, I'm seeing nodding heads from my organizers. Let's have a look at the question. Right, so uh, this is a question all the way from the US. Um, so the question is, you may get it on a subsequent chart, but could you reconcile the LP desire for diversification versus the very high levels of performance dispersion from median to top quarter results? Yeah, so uh, diversification uh, is a really, really broad term. Of course, you know, the, the, the most ideal diversification would be if I can have strategy, geography, um, industry diversification without, you know, without the need to uh, be lowering, lowering my returns, you know, that would be the best sort of diversification to look at. And I think the high levels of performance dispersion from the median to top quartile results really just highlights how important it is for LPs to be focused and doing their due diligence on who are the managers out there who could possibly be producing the best results for them. And that's why uh, for us, you know, having the ability to benchmark funds, having the ability to look at past uh, historical returns on a named fund basis, it's very important because this just opens up so many new, so many more data points um, to our clients and our users that they can look at in order to assess how, uh, what is the you know probability of a fund manager delivering for me going forward five, ten, fifteen years into the future? Because we also mustn't forget that these relationships last can last for decades. Uh, I recall a conversation with a sovereign wealth fund in APEC uh, where um, the investment manager told us, when, when we look at investing, you know, we are looking at a 10, 20, 30 year investment horizon. And that's why you know, we put in so much effort in the due diligence bit into identifying the best performing managers. And um, I, this person also told us that he is aware that this relationship can go on for decades and would last beyond his time with the firm even. So I hope that uh, was, uh, was a, I hope uh, that helped to answer the question. I can see a few more questions coming in, uh, but I'm afraid you know, we, we don't have time uh, during this webinar to answer all of these. I think what we will do is we will take these questions and uh, we will be sending out a communication to everybody who came, who attended this webinar. And uh, I think, you know, that will help you to see our response as well. Thank you, Ifai, and thank you all for all your questions and for staying with us throughout today's session. Uh, we will also have a very short survey at the end where five lucky respondents will walk away with a complimentary copy of the Pre-Queen 2020 Global Alternatives Report. 
So on behalf of all of us at Pre-Queen, stay safe and please feel free to get in touch with us with your questions and comments. We wish you and your teams all the very best ahead in the coming months. And thank you. Thank you, everybody, and take care.